Let's talk about block rims. Uh, block RAM is a discrete part of an FPGA used to store data, and this video is going to discuss lots of details about where they might be used, how they're used, so let's get into it. Block RAMs. When might a block RAM be used, or a BRAM for short? In general, storing data. Um, so for example, large lookup tables like a lookup table that converts Celsius to Fahrenheit where you're given a Celsius value and you want to look at what the Fahrenheit value is for that particular Celsius input, you can use a lookup table for that. Given some X, what's the Y? That's a lookup table. Storing read-only data, like some, maybe you have some calibration parameters for your design uh, that get uh, written only by the FPGA bitstream programming the block RAM and they, they get read by your design to calibrate some sensor, for example. You might be using a block RAM to store uh, data off of some external device like an analog to digital converter or a flash. Uh, maybe you do some filtering on that analog digital converter and you need to store some data, um, some history to do the filter. That's a pretty common way to do it. Maybe you have a FIFO. A FIFO is a first in, first out uh, data storage. Basically, it's like a buffer. Uh, maybe storing some temporary data. FIFOs are always used for temporary data. Um, for, this is extremely common in video applications. So storing one row of incoming video data to buffer it up is a very common usage for uh, block RAMs. In that situation, it's usually used to cross clock domains, which I'm going to talk about. Oh, oh, there's the next bullet. Crossing clock domains inside of, a uh, inside of an FPGA using a FIFO is a very common uh, use for block RAMs. This is extremely important and that's the, the details of how to cross a clock domain is for another video. Uh, but in general all these things are just ways to store large amounts of data. So what is a block RAM? Uh, it's a discrete part of your FPGA just like lookup tables and registers are discrete parts of your FPGA. Each FPGA has a limited discrete number of block RAMs available to you. And the way to find out how many you have is to go to your website for your particular FPGA that you're using and then look under something that says like embedded RAM bits, uh, something to that effect. So this FPGA, the HX1K from Lattice, has 64K block RAM bits. Uh, the HX4K has 80K of block RAM bits, a little bit more there. Uh, the thing that you need to know here is it tells you the total amount of RAM bits, but each individual block RAM has uh, some amount of storage. So in the lattice chips, it's a four, they're 4K block RAMs. So there's a discrete, so 64 divided by 4 is how many total block RAMs there are, how many discrete block RAMs there are on this particular FPGA. And that's important to know. You can't use individual bits of a block RAM in different parts of your design. You have to use the whole thing all at once. And I'll get into a little bit more details about that. Most block RAMs can be initialized to non-zero values on the FPGA initialization. So when the FPGA comes up, gets loaded from the bitstream, most FPGAs can be initialized to something non-zero, which is useful for the ROM application, the read-only memory that I discussed previously. Uh, one exception is microsemi because of the way that the FPGAs are designed. Those are unable to be preloaded. Uh, there's a lot of configuration options for block RAMs. So there's single port, dual port, and FIFO. Those are the three most common, and I'm going to discuss each one of those, how they're the same, how they're different. In general, though, if you look at the picture over here, uh, block RAM has some width and some depth. And if you multiply width times depth, you're going to get either 4K, 8K, 16K, or 32K are the most common block RAM sizes. Usually 16K is fairly common for, for most FPGAs, but the bigger ones today are going to 32, maybe even 64. Um, some smaller FPGAs, like the one on the Nanland Go board, is a 4K block RAM. But the thing is, is that you need to remember that you always need to multiply width, width by depth to get one of these numbers. You can't uh, divide the block RAM in half arbitrarily. Um, so pretty commonly you'll see widths that are like one bit wide, two bits, the width needs to be a base two number. So one bit wide, two bit wide, four bit wide, eight, 16, 32, 64, maybe even 128, but that's rare. rare. You know, most of the time it's something like 16 bits wide by whatever, 4K divided by 16 deep, okay? So there's different types of configurations for block RAMs. Uh, there's a single port configuration. In general, block RAMs have two ports. Port A and port B is what they're commonly referred to as. 
and they have the same signals on both sides. Um, on a single port configuration, port B is not used at all, so you're only reading and writing from port A. You know, your, your port A could be in a ROM application read only, in which case write enable is never used. It could be a read write application, uh, whatever it is, these are the most common signals. There are other signals on a block RAM, but these are the ones that are most important to understand. So block RAMs are synchronous pieces of logic. Synchronous means that they're driven by a clock. So a clock is critical to having a block RAM. Some block RAMs have a reset input, most do actually, um, that can reset them back to some initial zero condition. There's a write enable signal. When this is high, whatever data is on this write data, um, synchronous to the clock will be written at that particular address. You get all that? Uh, so address tells you where in the block RAM at what index to read or write to. Uh, when you have write enable high, so I want to write something, it'll clock the data into the block RAM uh, on the rising edge of the clock, whatever data is in this write data input. When write enable is low, the block RAM will always just read out onto the read data output whatever address you give it. So if you just set address to zero, it'll always just be reading from address space zero of your block RAM continuously. And that's okay. Uh, there's really no negative, there's no reason not to have it do that. You just can ignore the data if you don't really care about it. So that's the single port configuration. That's the simplest one. Uh, dual port block RAM configuration is when there are two clocks, uh, port A and port B are both going to be used. And so that might be, for example, if you're, if you're writing data on port A on the same clocks that you're reading data off of port B, um, that might be a configuration in which you need to use two ports instead of just one. You know, on a single port configuration, you obviously can't read and write on the same clock cycle because you can only read or write at one time. A single, so a dual port configuration, you can read on one clock cycle, write on the same clock cycle, right? Read. Uh, so that might be a situation in which you need to use a dual port configuration. The thing to note about dual port configuration is that the clocks can be the same or they can be different. So this is the way, the best way in your design uh, to cross clock domains with large amounts of data is to use a block RAM to act between the two clock domains. Because, clock, because block RAMs are specifically designed to work across different clock domains. So if there's clock A is running at, clock on port A is running at 50 megahertz and clock at port B is running at 670 megahertz, uh, that's okay. The block RAM will actually handle that. If on a normal conditions, if you try to just clock data from one domain to another domain, you can get problems, metastability problems, which is another topic for a different video. So um, block RAMs are a great way to control the flow across clock domains for this reason here is that there's, there's two ports, each with their own uh, set of wires running at their own set of frequencies. You can never write to the same address at the same time from both ports because there's gonna be contention there. So that's one thing you definitely wanna avoid. Um, and, and also there's, there's, there are some problems uh, one little like nit can be if you write to the address and you read from the address on the same clock cycle, which data gets there first. And that actually depends on the individual FPGA that you're using. So uh, just one little thing to be careful about. Not super common though. And the last configuration that block RAMs can be set up in is a FIFO configuration, which again is a first in first out. And this is extremely common for block RAMs to be set up as FIFOs. And uh, FIFOs generally have two, it's the same signals, but they're kind of called different things when it's a FIFO configuration. Um, instead of port A and port B, there's a write side and a read side. Instead of write enable, it's, I, I call it write DV or write data valid. So that's a pulse that's synchronous to the clock that tells the block RAM when to look at this write data input and register it into the block RAM fabric. The new signals here are these four at the bottom, full, almost full, empty, and almost empty. Full and almost full are on the right side. So the, the, the data that's being shoved into your FIFO, FIFO can be thought of as like a tunnel, um, driving through a tunnel. So there's, there's people, cars driving into the tunnel, cars driving out of the tunnel. Um, two rules, FIFOs are for a different topic, uh, different 
video, I believe. Um, they're complicated enough to talk about them separately, so I won't get into too, too many details about how FIFOs work, but uh, two basic rules of a FIFO, never write to a full FIFO, never read from an empty FIFO. If you obey those two rules, you're going to be great. Uh, there's another video coming about FIFOs, so stay tuned for that. So those are the main reasons why, uh, how you would use a block RAM. Uh, how specifically you would code to create block RAMs, there's three main ways to do it. They can be instantiated. Instantiated means the way you instantiate a sub module in your code, you can instantiate a block RAM the exact same way. And most of the user guides for the individual uh, vendors, FPGA vendors, will tell you how to instantiate it. So there's usually a user guide that tells you memory memory usage guide, and this will really, you should definitely read this entire thing start to finish if you have never used block RAMs before because there's a lot of details in here about how they work. So I highly recommend you go look at, you know, for whatever FPGA you're using, look at the memory usage guide for it and then try to read through it carefully and understand block RAMs. This video should give you a high enough overview so that you feel like you understand what this thing is talking about before you get started, but this is still important to, to read through. So here's an example of a Verilog instantiation of a 256 deep by 16 wide block RAM. And this just shows you how you wire it up in Verilog, and here's some initialization stuff that you can do as well. And every vendor will have this type of information on their data sheet. So that's the first way, instantiation. I like to instantiate block RAMs personally <coughs> under the, it, with one caveat, which is that you need to create a wrapper around them. Um, it's a little bit more advanced, but if you can create wrappers around instantiated block RAMs, you can make them very dynamic. Um, kind of nice. Uh, you can infer block RAMs. Infer, inference means that you write VHDL or Verilog code that describes a block RAM, but you don't specifically tell the tools, please put a block RAM here. The tools will say, I think what he wants to do is he wants to put a block RAM here, and they'll go infer that and put one down for you. Um, I do recommend this way once you're comfortable with block RAMs. I think this is probably the best way to do it. Um, each user guide will tell you the recommended way for their particular synthesis tool to infer block RAMs the best. So for example, for the lattice, if you scroll down to the bottom of the memory usage guide, there's this section here. It says standard HDL code references. So here's what a single port RAM looks like if you want to infer it. You can just copy and paste this into your code. So that's pretty handy there. Here's the HDL. Here's dual port RAM here. Verilog, dual port RAM VHDL, same thing. And the third way uh, for most FPGA uh, companies is you can use their, their GUI to create them. Um, this is good for beginners. So if you've never used block RAMs before and you wanna just like get, click through the tool and see all the different ways you can customize them, I, I think this is a good way to do it. You should try, try playing with this. Um, my reason I'm hesitant for people who do large designs or advanced FPGA folks is that I have personally worked with designs where you can, the, the issue with creating them via the GUI is that you create one block RAM with one depth, one width and one depth. So if I need a 16K wide by 256 deep, I create it once and it, I store it in some file. Oh, and now I need eight wide by 512 deep. I gotta create that one. Oh, and now I need four wide by 1024 deep. I gotta create that one separately. And so you ended up in this situation where you're just creating these block RAMs over and over again to solve um, to, to solve different situations in which you might need them, and that becomes tedious to keep track of it. So uh, for very large designs, I don't recommend this method, but for small design, just checking it out, it's fun. So that takes care of block RAMs. Read the u memory usage guide for whatever FPGA you're working with. If you don't yet have an FPGA to work with, I recommend buying the Go board on, at nanland.com. They're available today for sale, and it's the best way to keep me making these videos. The more Go boards that I'm able to sell, the more videos I'm, I'm able to create. So the better the whole system gets. So please support this YouTube channel and get yourself a Go board today. Thanks.